Today on Styrene Modeler's Haven. So, you want to get your first airbrush, huh? Oh boy, this rabbit hole goes deep. Where to begin? Don't worry, I'll break it down and make it simple. For scale modelers, getting your first airbrush can be a game changer in the quality of your paint jobs on your builds. From simple paint jobs, to camo, natural metal finish, and everything in between, with the right airbrush, the possibilities are limitless. With so many airbrushes to choose from, it can be daunting to decide which one to get. I broke down the four most common types of airbrushes, starting with the single action siphon feed airbrush. One of the best known workhorses in this type of setup is the Posh H. This airbrush seems like it's been around forever and has been a workhorse for a lot of scale modelers and was my first airbrush. In testing all the airbrushes, I try to keep everything consistent. I use the same paint, Tamiya Black, and the same thinner for all the airbrushes, mixing the paint approximately 50-50. When testing all the airbrushes, I did two pressure settings, one at 20 PSI and one at 10. 20 is typically what most airbrushing is done at, somewhere between 15 and 20. 10 is when you're doing high detail work and you need thinner paint, but at a lower pressure. Siphon feed airbrushes use air pressure to draw paint up into the nozzle. Because of this, you can only go so low with your pressure before the paint just starts to spit as there's not enough air to blow that paint out smoothly. Single action means that when pressing down on the trigger, the only thing you're able to control is air pressure. To control paint flow, you can either get closer or further away from your work, and with some models, you're able to adjust the nozzle. I started by doing basic saturation passes. Further away from the paper, and closer to the paper. I even opened and closed the nozzle here and there just to see the difference between the paint flow. I then set the PSI to 10 and did similar tests at this lower PSI, seeing how well the paint would come through the nozzle and if there was any spitting. With these types of airbrushes, this is typically the limiting factor. You really can't do any fine detail work as the thinner the paint and the lower the PSI, the harder these airbrushes have in getting that paint to come out smoothly since you can't get enough air pressure to pull that paint up into the nozzle and spray it out evenly. Even as a beginner, once you get a little bit of practice under your belt, this is typically where you're going to hit the limits of this airbrush pretty quickly. The last test I did with this airbrush was on an actual model part. This was to test to see how much overspray and how large the overspray would be when spraying on an actual part. Typically with these types of airbrushes, the overspray will go further away from the area that you're working and the spray pattern itself will have larger splotches as it gets further and further away. One thing I wanted to check was how easy it was to put this airbrush into my airbrush holder. With a cup or bottle mounted to a siphon feed airbrush, it's typically not going to be able to go into a slip-in type airbrush holder, but you can hang it on a clip style airbrush holder. Of course, no airbrush test is complete without seeing how complicated it is to clean and how many parts are going to be needed to take apart in order to clean it. The Posh H airbrush and airbrushes like it are usually pretty simple to clean with only a few parts to disassemble and take to the sink. They're relatively easy to break down and reassemble. Reassembly of the airbrush was the reverse of the disassembly and the airbrush was ready to go again. So is this a good first airbrush for scale models? To answer that, we have to test the other three to get a good comparison. So let's move on to the next type of airbrush that's usually a step up. A siphon feed double action airbrush. The siphon portion of this airbrush works just the same as the other one, using air pressure to draw paint up into the nozzle. Now, with the double action trigger, not only can you control air pressure by pressing down on the trigger, but when you pull back on the trigger, you're able to control paint flow 
by closing and opening the nozzle. Unlike the previous airbrush, where you have to manually open and close the nozzle by twisting on it, with the double action trigger, you're able to control paint flow on the fly. Starting again with the first test at 20 PSI, we put this airbrush through its paces. We start with the general passes. One of the first things we immediately notice is how much smoother and tighter the paint sprays onto the paper, especially when you compare it side by side to the first airbrush. Unlike the previous airbrush where we didn't have control over the paint flow and we either had to get further or closer to the surface to control the saturation, now with the double action trigger, we can control how much paint comes out of the airbrush while staying consistent to the distance of the surface. Because of this extra control over the paint flow, we don't have to pull our airbrush away from the surface or get closer in to do fine detail work. With this extra control, we can set the PSI on the compressor at one setting and further be able to control how much paint comes out through the trigger. Using a Sharpie and then a ballpoint pen as a frame of reference, you can see how tight the line and control gets with this type of setup. Dropping the PSI down to 10, we do another set of tests to see how tight and how close we can get the fine detail work. This airbrush uses a different needle and nozzle setup. This type of setup allows the paint to flow much tighter and finer, so you get less overspray and a much cleaner spray pattern. Working in concert with the double action trigger, you now have full control over the paint flow and the pressure. Just like the single action airbrush, the siphon feed does draw pressure in order to bring that paint up into the needle and nozzle. And so yet again, we run into the same issue of only being able to dial down the pressure to a point where the airbrush will start spitting, depending on how thick the paint is. Typically when doing fine detail work, your paint is usually thinned past 50%. The thinner your paint gets, the lower the pressure needs to be so you can still spray that paint in a controllable pattern. So even with the upgraded design of a double action trigger, and a better needle and nozzle setup, there is still a limit as to how fine of a detail you can get out of this type of an airbrush. Now there are advantages to this and the previous type of siphon feed airbrush. The most obvious being that you can put larger bottles onto these airbrushes to be able to move more paint if you have a larger project that you need to paint. One small factor about using a bottle with one of these siphon airbrushes it's not a big deal, but it is something to be concerned about, is depending on the angle that you're spraying at, the straw inside the bottle that's drawing the paint up, if it's at an angle that it's not allowing to get submerged into the paint, it's no longer going to be able to spray that paint. So that's something that you have to play with the tilt and the angle of the bottle and adjust as necessary. We can't forget about testing this airbrush on an actual model part seeing what kind of spray pattern and overspray it leaves, and how fine the particles are as you go further out from the area that you're working on. And now we can compare this against the other airbrush just to see how much smoother the paint is once dry. This type of airbrush typically also does a better job in slipping into the airbrush holder. You can also hang it on an airbrush rack if you have the bottle installed or put it on the airbrush clip. Being an upgraded design, there are going to be more parts to clean on this airbrush, and the needle and the nozzle tend to be a little bit more fragile, so care has to be taken in both removing it and screwing it back into the body of the airbrush. So we've definitely seen a marked improvement in the quality of the paintwork from the siphon feed double action airbrush. But before we can make any conclusions, Let's move on to the next airbrush. Probably the most commonly used setup and favorite amongst most scale modelers is going to be the double action gravity feed airbrush. The biggest improvement over this design compared to the others is you no longer need air pressure to bring paint into the needle and nozzle. Just as the name implies, gravity is used 
to feed the paint into the body of the airbrush by mounting the cup at the top. Now we have complete control not only over air pressure and paint flow, but we no longer have to share that air pressure with the paint to get it up into the needle. With the right needle and nozzle setup, you can now dial down the pressure, sometimes below 10 PSI, to get the finest detail out of your airbrush. The biggest benefit of this is you can now thin your paint, sometimes up to 90% thinner, and still have control over that paint flow. No one airbrush can do every type of airbrushing task for scale modeling, but a double action gravity feed airbrush is about as close as you can get especially when you're new to airbrushing and you don't want to have to buy several airbrushes to figure out which is the right one, a double action gravity feed is a good place to start. The learning curve might be a little bit longer, but not that much different from even a single action airbrush. And once you get practice with this type of airbrush, you can go all the way from priming a model down to the finest details. Over the 20 years of airbrushing with scale models, I've collected quite a few airbrushes. Some of them I bought just for fun to see what they could do and others I bought for specific tasks. But if I were to start all over again, my first airbrush would be a high quality, double action, gravity feed airbrush. Doing similar tests to the other two airbrushes on a piece of paper, you can see how close and how much control I have over the paint flow at a very low PSI with very thin paint. So instead of having to spend money on a first airbrush, a second airbrush, and possibly even a third, many high quality double action gravity feed airbrushes usually range around $100 and can do 90% of the airbrushing that you'll want to do with a scale model. Again, using the same paint and similar PSI, I spray a model part so we can compare the overspray and the spray pattern to the first two airbrushes. There won't be much difference between this and the double action siphon feed airbrush. Being that, as mentioned before, the main difference is the control over fine detail work. The other benefit of the cup being mounted on the top of the airbrush is it now can fit and slide into a standard airbrush holder and you can also hang it on a clip. Much like the double action siphon feed airbrush, cleanup will be similar. The parts count are going to be about the same and the only main difference will be how fragile the needle will be when reinserting it into the body of the airbrush. So you might ask why go any further since it seems like this type of airbrush is really the best one to get and there's no further discussion. But hold on, there is one more type of airbrush that's sort of unusual and kind of a hybrid and worth mentioning. So what do we have here? It doesn't look like the other airbrushes, but obviously you can paint with it. Just as the name implies, the pistol grip airbrush is very much like a double action airbrush, but with a few different changes. The most obvious being the way that you grip this airbrush. Unlike holding the other airbrushes where you grip it more like a pen, this one is gripped as a pistol with your trigger finger pulling back as one motion. The cup is mounted on the top or on the side, making this gravity fed. But unlike the previous double action trigger where you push down to release the pressure and pull back to open the nozzle, when you pull back on a pistol style airbrush, the trigger operates both motions at the same time. Having both styles of airbrushes, I find that the pistol grip airbrush has a shorter learning curve and for many can be easier to operate. And just like the siphon feed airbrush, most pistol grip airbrushes have an interchangeable cup with different sizes. So if you're looking to move a lot of paint, you can actually increase the size of the bottle, allowing you to paint for a longer amount of time. So we put this airbrush through the same paces as we've done with the previous ones so that we have a fair basis of comparison. General passes give similar results to the second and third airbrush we've already tested. The paint comes out smooth with a much finer overspray and we have full control over the saturation. And since the paint is gravity fed, we can dial this airbrush down many times below 10 PSI so we can even do fine detail work. Possibly the only strike I can give against this style of airbrush 
is you can't quite get as fine of a detail as you could with the previous airbrush. Because the trigger doesn't allow for separate control of the airflow and opening and closing the nozzle, it's a bit harder to maintain proper low airflow with very thin paint when doing fine detail work. Also, because you are gripping this airbrush with your entire hand, many times when you're doing fine close-up detail work, you can't quite get as close as you can with the other pen-style airbrushes. Yet these are minor points and they can be overcome with a little bit of practice. Spraying this on a model part, we're able to compare the differences between the spray pattern and the overspray against all the other airbrushes. And just like the other double action airbrushes, it leaves a nice tight pattern. When it comes time to cleaning a pistol style airbrush, I do find that there's usually a little bit more of a parts count to have to clean and take to the sink. When it comes time to putting this airbrush down, you have to come up with a little bit more of a unique way to hang it. So I found that you can place it on the hanger of an airbrush holder, or by taking two clips, you can spread the airbrush across those. Having put the four most common styles of airbrushes through the paces and comparing the results of each one, we now can see what will be the best style of airbrush, especially for a beginner. But before choosing which airbrush is right for you, no discussion is complete without talking about your air supply. In my 20 plus years of using airbrushes, I found the most reliable source of air is coming from a compressor that is mounted onto a small tank. Any compressor can work, even the ones that are designed for air tools, but those can be quite noisy, especially if you want to do airbrushing inside. I prefer this compressor with a tank as it's only 46 decibels when operating, which is about the same as a conversation. There are airbrush compressors without a tank, and they do a good enough job. The issue is, is that they're continuously run, so they have a shorter lifespan as they tend to burn themselves out. No matter what setup you decide to go for your air compressor, there are two components that are going to be necessary for all airbrushing tasks. The first piece is a water trap. This is going to make sure that your air is clean and water free so you don't get any contamination when you're airbrushing. The other piece is a valve so that you can control your PSI since most airbrushing for scale modelers don't usually go above 30 PSI. There's actually very little maintenance with this setup. Usually the only two things I have to be concerned about is just making sure that the water trap doesn't get filled up with water and if it does just completely draining it out and letting it dry. The only other thing I need to remember to do is when I'm done airbrushing for the day is to unscrew the drain plug at the bottom of the tank. This will allow any water that's in the tank to completely dry out so that it doesn't rust out the tank from the inside. Though not required, a nice little convenience I've added to my air hose is a quick release with an adjustable valve built in. This allows me to quickly disconnect my airbrush and switch to another one if needed, as well as adjusting the pressure right at the airbrush. I usually set my compressor PSI at 20 and then just adjust everything from the airbrush valve itself. No matter what type of airbrush you decide to go with, there are two first steps I recommend before putting one drop of paint through that airbrush. The first thing you should always do with a new airbrush is completely disassemble it. This will allow you to learn all the parts and pieces that make that airbrush go together and work, and will also show you which parts will and will not need to be cleaned when you're done with an airbrush session. The other thing I always recommend before spraying any paint is to spray something else through it that isn't going to be required for you to clean the airbrush, water, rubbing alcohol, or some type of thinner. Spraying it on a sheet of paper, this will allow you to play with the airbrush without having to go and clean it later on. Hopefully now you have the knowledge needed to purchase the airbrush that's right for you. I provided links in the description of all the airbrushes in this video along with the compressor. If you click on the links in the description and make a purchase, I get paid a small commission from the seller, so thank you for supporting my channel. I've also provided a link of my personal favorite airbrush and compressor combo that I think is perfect for someone brand new to airbrushing scale models. Did you know I have an eBay scale model store? That's right, I sell new and vintage model kits and accessories. Be sure to check it out, I've left a link in the description.
Use code YouTube10, that's the number 10, to get 10% off any purchase made at my eBay store. Like this video and smash that subscribe button. Be sure to check out some of my other how-to videos. Learn my favorite methods on filling gaps and seams and applying natural metal finish. Join my email newsletter and get 10 free tips and tricks on scale modeling. Drop a comment and let me know what you thought about this video. Thanks for watching.